and after an incredibly successful career, one of the biggest names in anime history, Hayao Miyazaki, is finally completing his time in the sun to leave with a deeply emotional and personal peace and headed for retirement uh, again. Yeah, sure, because Miyazaki only lasted 10 years, right. But he did take 10 years between his final movie and his second final movie. I personally believe Wind Rises to be one of the best movies to release from Studio Ghibli and was an incredible final piece for Miyazaki. So does The Boy and the Heron live up to that legacy? Well, in a way, sure. But I want to first get my biggest complaint out of the way. My biggest problem with The Boy and the Heron is The Boy and the Heron. That is the, the title before you get mad at me. Now, this does not take away from the actual experience of the movie at all, but this title really doesn't do the movie justice. The original Japanese title translates to How Do You Live, which is a way better title. Before the movie release, the title change was announced for the international release, and that was disappointing. But now having seen the movie, it's even more clear that How Do You Live is a far better title than The Boy and the Heron. No spoilers here, but the movie does touch on this concept and a character even says those words, further cementing the movie's messages. The story's built around discovering a reason for this question, and it's beautiful. The title, The Boy and the Heron, is not a bad title per se, but there's no philosophical weight behind it. They may as well have renamed Spirited Away to The Girl and the Witch, or how about Wind Rises to The Man and His Planes. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, of course, and I'm just being salty about it, because, you know, it's what's in the movie that makes the difference. But a good title goes a long way, and for some reason, they decided to get rid of the good title for this movie. Oh well. Now, like I just hinted, it's time to talk about what's in the movie itself. Starting things out, visually, this movie is great. There are numerous sequences that are chock full of quick and incredibly artistic drawn frames that create an immersive and immensely creative experience. I feel there are other Ghibli movies that have crazier looks and I am i don't want to say better art direction, but that's what I'm leaning towards. But that isn't anything against this movie, I'm just praising other ones more. For this movie, it felt that there was an aspect of, you know, having already seen a Miyazaki fantasy world so many times before that I kind of knew what I expected and since it was pretty on par with what I thought I would see, there was not much that surprised or impressed me. Again, not a diss against this movie, it's just that I've seen them do it before, so I guess my socks just weren't blown off by seeing them do it again, which is fine. I did like it. Personally, it was not until I watched The Wind Rises, sorry, I mean, it was not until I watched The Man and His Planes that I began to connect with Ghibli's typical style and aesthetic, but I have to say I really enjoyed looking at this movie. As for the voice acting, there are a few well-known names in here, but most of the voice actors in this movie haven't been in many well-known projects, which may have seemed like it was a deliberate choice, as opposed to the stark contrast with the English dub that just hired some of the most well-known names in Hollywood right now so they can sell this movie more. That's not a complaint from me, just something I noticed and thought was interesting. Here's the thing. I can't speak to the dub performances, as I did watch the subtitled version, but I'll say this, I would be surprised if they did a bad job producing this dub. Ghibli dubs are are just cracked. I mean, look at these casts. Ponyo, Matt Damon, Liam Neeson, Kate Blanchett, Betty White, Dee Bradley Baker, Howl's Moving Castle, Christian Bale, Josh Hutchinson, Billy Crystal, Dee Bradley Baker again, The Secret World of Arietti, Amy Poehler, Will Arnett, Mark Strong, only Yesterday, Daisy Ridley, Dev Patel, When Marnie Was There, Haley Steinfeld, John C. Riley, Kiki's Delivery Service, Kirsten Dunst, oh boy. <laughs> Tales from Earthsea, Willem Dafoe, Princess Mononoke, Billy Crudup, Keith David, Porco Rosso, Michael Keaton, and again, D. Bradley Baker, Pompoco, Clancy Brown, J.K. Simmons, Kevin Michael Richardson, The Tale of Princess Kaguya, John Cho, Daniel Day Kim, Oliver Platt, Lucy Liu, James Kahn, Mary Steenburgen, James Marsden, The Wind Rises, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, John Krasinski, Emily Blunt, Martin Short, Stanley Tucci, Mae Whitman, Werner Herzog, Elijah Wood, William Macy, Castle in the Sky is the only one where watching the dub is illegal because Mayumi Tanaka voices Pazu in the original version. And that's just the best. And finally, The Boy and the Heron, Christian Bale, Dave Bautista, Gemma Chan, Willem Dafoe again, 
Mark Hamill, Robert Pattinson, Florence Pugh, Tony Revolori, Dan Stevens, Karen Fukuhara, and there's more. But that's all that we'll be touching on today because these casts are insane. And here's the thing. Many of them don't even give off anime dub vibes. I'm not dissing all anime dubs here, but there is a vibe where you're like, oh yeah. Specifically in the shonen world. Luffy, it's good to see you, buddy. Luffy! And none of these movies give off that feeling. And that is what I expect from this movie, The Boy and the Heron. I will say though, not having seen it, but Willem Dafoe is the perfect choice for the character he's playing because the Japanese voice actor for the same character just sounds like if Willem Dafoe spoke Japanese. So yeah, as far as animation and voice acting, exactly what everyone would have expected from Ghibli. It's just great. If you're like me and you love not only watching the cinema of anime, but hearing about it as well, then hey, I've got the perfect button for you to press. And yes, you're right, that would be the subscribe button, and that's not meant to overshadow the like button either. It all goes a long way. Okay, the story. Now, Miyazaki is known for his critically and usually universally praised storytelling. I mean, there's a reason that Spirited Away is loved by so many people across the world. And when I figure out what that reason is, I'll let you know. Uh, for legal reasons, I have to specify, that was a joke. I do actually like Spirited Away. So, was the boy in the heron well told? I mean, yes, again, no surprise there. I don't love every movie Miyazaki has put out there, I'll be honest, but I always give him props for the way he tells his stories. And even if I'm not a fan of one or two of those stories, he tells them the way he wants. He's always very intentional in the pacing, the structure, and the development, and I do have to give him respect for that. The Boy and the Heron, again, without spoiling anything that the trailers already haven't, is much like many of Miyazaki's other stories. You know, there's a real world setting and a fantasy one, and the differences between the two are very well displayed, and the characters and events immerse you in those worlds brilliantly. Underneath the spectacle lies a very personal story about the state of our world and how we live in it. Again, how do you live is a better title. The messaging doesn't seem to go as far as some of his other works, but they are definitely still there. The different sequences and scenes are all enjoyable, so I'm not upset at them being in the movie, but again, not everything contributes to the message, which is fine. The movie still progresses nicely. And in fact, I have felt this way about some of his other films and other Ghibli movies as well, where, you know, things happen during the story's progression, and sometimes I wonder, what the overall meaning is. Not that those scenes were bad in any means, but after I think about it, I still feel like not everything was absolutely necessary, which is okay, it's still enjoyable. A lot of Ghibli movies take a bit for me to get into, I will be honest on that. The first half usually feels rather long, not bad, but still long, and then it starts to pick up, and then by the third act I'm into it. The opening scene of The Boy and the Heron had me hooked. I was all in, and then progressively I moved back to the space of, well, let's just see how this goes. At no point did I dislike any of it, but it did start brilliantly and then take a while to follow that up. And I'm not mad about it because really there's only been one Ghibli movie that's kept me fully into it the entirety of its runtime. So what I got was more or less what I expected from The Boy and the Heron. It does follow suit with a few other Ghibli movies where the ending wraps itself up efficiently and quickly, which I actually appreciate. And I'm definitely left thinking about what the ending means. Not in a bad, you know, like, what did I just watch way, but in a, hmm, you know, so let's, wh what about this? What's the meaning of this or that? Like, let's think about this. Interesting. Which for this movie is a very good thing. Now. There's a reason I've left this topic for now, because it is easily the best part of the movie for me. But even if I'm not a huge fan of every single Ghibli movie I've watched, there's always something I will never not love wholeheartedly. And that is the fact that the music from any movie composed by Joe Hisaishi will be amazing. If Hisaishi is handling the music, you know it will be a, a beautiful experience. Now, apparently for The Boy and the Heron, Hayao Miyazaki gave Hisaishi an almost complete copy of the film without dialogue and then told him, I leave this with you. There was no instructions, requirements, or requests. It was all left up to Hisaishi to decide how the music will set the tone of the images that we will watch. The complete faith from Miyazaki would turn out to be not misplaced, because the score for The Boy and the Heron may just be Hisaishi's absolute best. Spirited Away and Wind Rises are very close competitors, but for me personally, I don't know, The Boy and the Heron might just take the cake. Not only is the music soft, sweet, and beautiful, but it's also dark and sad, and numerous times the score actually pierces you with sudden bursts of energy and emotion, building and building and selling you on every piece of drama, characters, and situations. There's plenty of strings and vocals adding to the music, all while that piano carries through the entire score, connecting every piece of personality and emotion together. So, Miyazaki's career with Ghibli has been one of spectacle, beauty, emotion, and 
deeply personal stories inspired by anti-war and environmentalist worldviews. While his previous final movie, The Wind Rises, feels like you know, more of a passion project and goodbye movie than any of Hayao Miyazaki's other films, I mean what with the ending literally being the main character saying, you know what, I've used up my creative years and I'm just gonna live now. The Boy and the Heron, or How Do You Live, is definitely worthy of the filmmaker's legacy, and honestly an excellent note to leave the industry on. And who knows, maybe now that he's retired, he'll have enough time to watch the entire screening of his son's next film. Thanks for listening, I've been Shin Glassman, along with one last call to subscribe, and as always, I will see you in the next one.